Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Denny and Cylinder, for leading us in a time of worship. Uh, these are songs which I, I used to really like, and we used to sing in our church as well. Uh, once again, warm greetings uh, and praise the Lord to everyone who has joined uh, this session. How then shall we live? By God's grace, we uh, we will be we were able to be together for the last six weeks, and this is the seventh week. Uh, that we are together and God has been speaking to us. I believe uh, God, uh, you know, personally, it was a great blessing for us. And I believe God has been speaking to us as well. So uh, tonight, we're going to, as we uh, continue to uh, look into this Colossians chapter three and verse one to two, it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. <clears throat> We've been looking at this theme, uh, at this theme, at to set your mind on things above. Over the last few weeks, we have been very intentional to fill our minds with their eternal things. We've been looking at uh, the two uh, ways that people die and what is their, uh, what is the consequences of that dying in sins and going to hell. What is, what happens there? And then people who die in the Lord, you know, they go to heaven and what happens there? Uh, and then we looked at uh, who goes to heaven, the condition of people who are in heaven. We looked at all those things 
and so uh, we've been uh, looking at what are the things which are uh, that uh, which are above and we were we were trying to see how to set our minds on things above and i believe it has done us all good now a very important question now we have tasted how powerful and how valuable it is to set our minds on things that are above but one question is in all our minds is how can we keep it up you know it's not uh, just a one of uh, event you know, how can we keep our mind on things that are above and how can we continue to nourish our own soul by fixing our mind and fixing our heart on the joy of future life with Jesus Christ that's a very important question so this is not supposed to be just a bible study you know which came out of the air okay let's do it let's uh, you know listen to it and that that's not the whole intention or the whole idea of it but we since the bible has commanded us since the lord has commanded us to do so we are going to look at how we can do this thing how can how we can set our minds again colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 to 2 again it says so if you have been raised with christ seek the things that are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your mind minds on things that are above not on things that are on the earth now we all know christ was jesus christ was crucified he this body was taken down and he he died and his body was taken down uh, taken down and put with put in a tomb and uh, but on the third day the life of the son of god the holy spirit came and you know he rose again on the third day and his body was wonderfully changed that day and here in colossians chapter 3 and 1 and 2 uh, paul is telling us now if you are a christian if you believe if you believe that jesus christ died for you and you are his child and if you are a christian the life the very life the resurrection life of the son of god jesus christ the very power which raised jesus christ out of the dead and made him alive and he is alive forevermore that same power the same life of god has come into you and that's why he is speaking of being uh, you know raised with christ we know yeah, as in ephesians chapter 2 uh, we read that we all have been dead and in our trespasses we were all dead toward god and we were deaf towards the words of the holy spirit we couldn't you know we were incapable of rising up on our own and following after jesus in the life of faith and obedience because we were dead in our sins there was nobody to give us life but because we believed in jesus christ that same life which uh, which was on uh, which uh, which is in jesus christ has been given to us and that's why that's why he says the life of christ has come to you that's a miracle of salvation you know go the, it, it's like the holy spirit gave you the kiss of life and you were raised with christ and then he says since you have been raised with christ since the same power of the lord jesus christ same power of the holy spirit which made jesus christ alive is in you you have a new life in him because of that we have all that he has purchased all that jesus christ purchased on the cross belongs to you and me what are they we know that we have been forgiven of our sins we have been reconciled to the father the wall of partition has been broken and we have been made one and we have been reconciled to god we have been given the gift of the holy spirit we read that he is the holy spirit is an advance given to us of the future glory and we have been adopted into the family of god we have been made heirs of uh, heirs of all heirs with jesus christ and we have heaven as our everlasting home and as our rest so all these things has been purchased and belongs to you if all this is true for you tonight the word of god is telling us set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth now tonight we're going to look at why should we set our minds on things above what is the value of meditating on things above why we should do this is it just a vain exercise that you know some of these books self made helps we uh, self helps which some of these books we uh, tell us in the marketplace or we're going to look at them how will so important i just want to turn your attention to luke chapter 12 and verses 13 to 21 i would like to read this passage to you you know it's two two events which is in these passages i want to draw your attention to those two events which jesus christ was telling and then it says then one from the crowd said to him that is jesus teacher tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me but he said to him man who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you and he said to them take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses and then the next event jesus is uh, is telling them then he spoke a parable to them saying the ground of a certain rich man 
yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and make my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this is your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which, be which you have provided? And then as a conclusion, Jesus is telling the people who, uh, who, who's listening to him, he says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, number one, why should we meditate? Or why should we set our minds on things about? Because number one, meditating on our future life will change our entire view of money and material things. You know, it's, if we see how Jesus addressed the issue of money, heaven and money, how he lingered, it's amazing to see, it's quite staggering how he addresses these issues. You know, these things seem to be coming together again and again as we go through the gospel. So here we read in the first, passage, uh, first two verses, you know, a man comes to Jesus and he says, you know, Jesus, you know, our brothers have been dividing this inheritance. And, you know, they have taken, you know, the big chunk and they've given me only a small chunk. We want you to come and sit on that judgment throne and help me so that we'll all get, you know, let's say there are five brothers. All of us get one fifth, you know, it should be divided equally. You know, I'm not getting my rights. You know, that's my right, I believe. I'm not able to get that right. So I want you to divide, in, in, in interfere in this matter and divide this inheritance righteously. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. He says, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Do you think, do you think that I came to this world just for this, to divide riches amongst your brothers? You know, it's very interesting to see where Jesus Christ, is, Christ refuses to intervene in some places. He was saying, this is not my focus. This is not why I came here. And then uh, Luke 12, 15, he says, and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You know, covetousness, the dictionary says, is an immoderate desire for wealth, inordinate desire for wealth, the greedy longing to have more. You know, they, whatever they have is not enough. You know, if they have one, you know, one car, they would like to have more because the neighbor has two cars. You know, if, uh, if a friend has got a different uh, a new fridge, for example, even if we cannot afford, I want that. Even if I have to take a loan, even if I have to pay over three months EMI or six months EMI, I'm still going by it. Covetousness. I would like to read this verse from the Amplified Version. It says, and he said to them, guard yourselves and keep free from all covetousness. It says the immoderate desire for wealth, the greedy longing to have more. For a man's life does not consist in and is not derived from possessing overflowing abundance or that which is over and above his needs. God will always provide for our needs. In Philippians chapter 4, he says, God will provide all our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He will not provide for our greeds. He will prov provide for our needs. Anything over and above our needs, we are coveting. We are, co you know, it go goes into an area of greed and covetousness. So he says, beware, take heed. And then he goes, you know, from verse 15, 16 onwards, he takes the, he tells a story, the parable of uh, the, the, the su very successful businessman. He had, a, he had a bumper crop that year, you know, he, 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 he might have so, uh, uh, sowed or, or uh, harvested maybe hundredfold, we don't know, but he had a bumper crop. And, you know, when he, ha when he harvested the crop, he didn't have place to store it in, in his barns. The barns were very small for the harvest. So what, did it, what does he say in his heart? He said, I'm going to pull down these barns. I'm going to build new. I'm going to store all those. And you know, 
I'm going to live. This is all that I want, you know, for my years. And he's got his, you know, uh, retirement plan all set up. I've got my social security all tied up or people in the US, as they say, my 401k is all done. Or as in India, we say my retirement, you know, my pension is all done. You know, I have put a lot of money in fixed deposits. You know, all everything is planned out. This is, this is the dream that I was li living for. And I and my wife and my children, we're going to travel. We're going to do this and do that and all that. He was a very successful organized businessman and he was a very good planner as well. But there was a problem. He was not thinking of the things that are above. How does Jesus say that? He says, God says, tonight, if you're going to die. Oh, let's imagine that one night he died and God, God is saying, you're a fool. You know, all of us want to go to heaven one day and say, we want to listen to that. Well, uh, words from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. But imagine when we go up to heaven, imagining or thinking or e expecting that God is going to give us a warm welcome and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And then we hear the words, you fool. What will our reaction be? He never ever thought of things that are above. He was only focused. His only thoughts were the things of the earth. You know, what is the height of folly? To live for the things of the world and neglect being rich towards God. You know, there's nothing wrong being a good, successful businessman. There's nothing wrong in having money. There's nothing wrong in giving, uh, living in a good house. There's nothing wrong in driving a good car. But when you neglect the things which are above, and when you're only focused, and when, when all your efforts are only for being rich in this world, that's when it gets into a problem. God calls us a fool. How is your life today? Are you trying to be rich towards God? Or are you trying only to be rich in this world? You know, a few weeks back in one of the sessions, I told you, we went to one of the medical colleges in, in, in India, a, a, a missionary medical college for a youth camp. And, you know, the main speaker, he was asking, what is your desire? You know, the, all these are children coming from, you know, different churches, you know, all Christians. Maybe some of them were pastors and all that. But then uh, pastor's kids and they have grown all their, all their life in churches and you know, not one of them, unfortunately, not one of them told that they want to take the gospel to an unreached place or be a missionary doctor. Oh, I want to share the gospel wherever they are. They are, you know, the, the, I still remember one person said, I want to be the CEO of the Disney world in Florida. How is your life today? What is your goal? What is your aim? Where are you investing your time? Where are you investing your treasures? Where are you investing your talents? What are you, are you trying to be rich towards God or only towards this world? And that is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 to 20, do not lay up for yourselves treasure or treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. He told us very clearly, we have to be rich towards God. Jesus is telling that, you know, the more that we invest on things here on earth, you know, our heart will be tied to the things below. More and more we'll be tied to the things which are below. So he's teaching us that we have to, be learned, we have to learn to be rich towards God. That's what Jesus is telling us. So the more that we invest towards Jesus' work on earth, the more your heart will be connected to Christ's home in heaven. That's where we want to go. You know, I like this analogy which Thomas Boston says. It's a very powerful analogy. It tells us in a very, it puts us all in a beautiful perspective. He says, this life, we are all actors. You know, it's like we are all actors in a theater. You know, we are on a stage in a play and all of us have a particular part to play in the story. Let's, let's say that, you know, I've got uh, the part of playing the prince. You know, I've got the best robes on, you know, maybe the crown on. I've got people coming and helping me out. Beautiful dress, you know, maybe a sword here and, you know, all those pomp and glory. That is what, that's the part that I've been designed to play. And let's, uh, let's imagine Denny you know, who, uh, who led us in worship before. Let's say that, you know, he's been given the, uh, the part of playing a pauper in that whole play. You know, he's got 
the ragged clothes on all holes and you know very uh, stingy and very dirty and torn and all that and his face is put with mud and all that just to make make an appearance that he's a pauper and what do we do when we on the when we are playing the, when we are uh, acting in the play we put this clothes on we go onto the stage and we uh, we play all these parts and then once the play is done what do we do we go to the backstage in the backstage what do we do you know, uh, let's, uh, my, I've been playing the part of the prince, so I've got a you know, beautiful robot. So I remove my robes, I remove my uh, crown, I remove all the, the jewelry, and I remove all the, all the costly costumes that I've been putting on to show that I'm a prince. I hang them, hang them on the hanger, and then I remove, I, I remove the clothes that I originally had, and I put it. And then Popper, Denny, who was playing the Popper, he will also remove all the, you know, the bad, stingy, dirty clothes and all that. And then he will take his own clothes and we put our, our you know, hands over each other's shoulders and we walk out of the back door uh, into the road. That's the real world. That's the real world. Now, what difference does it make that one got to play the part of the prince and other the pauper? You know, when both of us leave the theater, they go into the real world and what matters is not what they were on the stage for a short period of time, but what matters is who they are out there on the, on the main road. We were there on the stage maybe for half an hour or one hour maximum. After that, we are all we have gone out. That's the real world. But you know what the problem is? When I put on the robes of the prince, I think that this is the real world. I think I am a prince. I deserve all the glory. I deserve all the praise of men. I desire, I desire that everyone should bow down to me. Imagine that, you know, when I go out into the real world, I still think like that. Jesus says, no, everything here is passing away. This is a short time. We are just on a stage for a short while to play the roles which God has given. The real world where solid riches and joy are in the world, are, is the world which is to come. And so set your heart and minds on the things which are above. That's what Jesus is telling. We think this is where all the action is and this is where we can earn money and this is where we can enjoy and this is the real world. This world is only a passing shadow. However real and solid the stuff of this world feels. You might be living in a 32 story building, but your, there, there's a time when we have, to, we have to leave this world. We have not, as, as Paul says in, in, in one of his episodes, he says, we have not brought anything to this world and we will not take anything from this world either. But Job says, naked did I come to this world and naked will I go. Death is a great equalizer. No matter how rich or how poor, we will all have to leave this world one day. We'll have to leave the stage one day and then we will go into the real world. Then we will go out there in the real world. You have to understand that what lasts is only in heaven. So why be envious of a brother who has more than you do? You know, maybe I've got only, you know, 10,000 rupees salary. Somebody might have 10 lakhs. Why should I be envious of him? He's just playing this role for a short time on this earth. Then I and him, we will both go into the eternal place where the real world is. And then we will see. Why, did, why does it matter to us if he for a very short time got in this play on earth to have the role of a prince whilst I had, a, I had to play the role of a pauper? What difference does that make? What only thing what matters? is that you and me will have treasures in the real world that will never pass away. Denny who played the pauper, let's say, imagine Denny who play, played the pauper. Pauper, he had, he's got a mansion outside, you know, and I'm living in a, in a shanty town, you know, outside. And then, you know, just because I, for a short time here on, on the stage, I played the role of a prince. Just imagine that, uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, try to think, think over and above myself and, you know, try to rule over him. I'll be a fool. That's why God calls that person a fool. <laughs> Meditating on your future life will change your whole outlook in regarding to the material world and especially in regard to the money. You know, no matter how great riches we have, we will have to leave and then we'll have to go. So set your mind on things above and not on earthly. They have the correct perspective of material things. Have correct perspective of money. Have correct perspective of this worldly pleasures. How God sees us. Number two, if we set our mind on things above, 
you know, meditating on our future life will give us strength to endure. We are all, none of us, you know, I, I know different, all of us are going through different struggles. All of us are going through different problems in our life. You know, uh, as we say in Malayalam, uh, you know, uh, the elephant has got his own struggles and the ant has got his own struggles. We all are going through different struggles. But what, is, what gives us strength to endure all these struggles is the meditating on our future life. You know, when we read in Hebrews chapter 12, the second part of verse 2, you know, we read about Jesus. He said, it says, because of the joy awaiting Jesus, he endured the cross. One of the most horrific deaths that anybody could ever die. He was mocked. He was beaten on his face. His beard was pulled out. He was beaten on his face. He was spat upon. His back was beaten with whips from both sides. He was allowed to, he was made to carry that heavy cross all the way up to Golgotha. Then his hands were stretched and they were nailed to the cross. His feet were nailed to the cross. His side was pierced. He, he, you know, he went through the most, most torturing death that anybody could ever die. But he endured it. Even at those most torturous moments, he did not find a moment to curse his persecutors. He didn't find a moment to, to have bitterness against them. Even at that point, he was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know why, what, what they are doing. He had words of forgiveness. He had words of uh, kindness. He had words of comfort. Even at the cross, he was giving his mother, Mary, his mother, whom she, whom, who gave birth to Jesus, said, behold your son. He pointed her to John. And John, he, to John, he said, behold your mother. Even at that point, he was taking care of, your, of his mother at that time. He endured the cross. Why? Because of the joy awaiting for him. What was the joy? He seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Last week we saw about, Rome, about Revelation chapter 7. You know, when Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, we saw, you know, innumerable angels, innumerable people from around the world, Gentiles and Jews together, standing around the throne, worshiping, worshiping him and saying, salvation is because of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and because of God alone. The whole worship, the elders were falling down and laying their crowns at the, at the feet of Jesus. And the and and the creatures, and the angels, and the people who were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, they were worshipping together. Even at the cross, he was seeing them, and he endured it. The most painful and most horrific and most torturous death, he endured because of the joy awaiting for him. When did he have the mind on the things above? Throughout his life, but supremely when he came to the agonies of the cross. How did Jesus do that? Where did he find the strength in the flesh to deal with all that has happened upon him there? He says, because of the joy that was set before him. What's the joy? The joy that is coming in heaven. I believe, you know, when, when he will see that event, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, he, you know, what joy will be on his face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At that time, he will, you know, he, he will, I, I don't know. I'm just imagining, may, I don't know, maybe he will cry. Seeing all of us, hallelujah, one by one, millions and millions from around the globe, from the different continents, tribes, languages, nations, tongues, all coming together in, as one, as one, as one, children of one father, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, singing hallelujah to the lamb. Hallelujah, that, that's the joy that he saw while he was on the cross. Brothers and sisters, my friends, you know, when we meditate upon the joy that we're going to have in heaven, it will help us to endure the, the, the struggles and the pains that we, are, um, that, we will, that we are going through whilst on this earth. You know, but the Bible keeps you know, telling us, focusing us back again and again uh, to show us how short our life is and how long the eternity is and how great the joy that is waiting for us in heaven. So when we set our mind continuously on those things, on the heavenly things, we get the strength to endure the difficulties, to gut out the difficulties that you're facing this week and this month. You know, Pastor Colin Smith, he shared about his experience when he was 
traveling. He was visiting his family in UK. His wife's parents were living in the south part of England and they went and took a car. They went to the south part of England and they visited them and then they were going back to the north part of England to visit his parents who were living up there. I think it's in Scotland or Ireland. He was going there. But because it was late in the evening, they had booked a hotel in London to stay the night and then rise up in the morning and then go. You know, we all know when we book a hotel over the night, we try um, uh, just for a night, we try to book one of those cheap things. And in those, when we book, we have to pay in advance. So he reached there late in the evening. And as soon as he turned into the car park of that hotel, he knew that he was in the wrong place. He, there were very few people. It's a very dingy place, very stingy place, very, very dark, very, you know, uh, unkempt, you know, uh, for the last 40 years, nobody has maintained it, no paint work done. When he sat on the couch, it was creaking and squeaking, making all sorts of noises. It was smelly. And he carried all the cases up to the, uh, up to the room and he was, you know, uh, walking across the room and complaining. He said, why did we choose this? And why did we do this and that and all that? And his wife, as beloved wife said, honey, just sit down. Just sit down. Just calm yourself down. It's only one night. It's only one night. That's what's going to make all the difference. Hallelujah. It makes all the difference in our perspective. When we are going through this life, when we understand that this is a, only a fleeting moment, just like in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 16, 4, 17, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. That gives us the strength to endure. It's only for a short moment. But how do we keep going when it's really tough? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, it says, how hard your affliction is. It is just momentary. We need to understand that in the light of eternity, it is just momentary, just like this compared to the time, the joyous time that we're going to spend with Jesus. So the momentary affliction that we have here on the earth is preparing us for to receive the eternal weight of glory beyond, beyond all comparison. We don't lose heart because we do not look at the things which are seen, but on the unseen, because what is seen is, it's not eternal. What, what is unseen is eternal. So we, we, believe, we understand that we are going to be in a better place tomorrow. When Jesus comes back or when we die and go to heaven, we'll be in a better place, much better place tomorrow. So set your minds with things that are above. Fill your mind and heart and minds with your eternal home. It will not only change our thinking regarding this material world, it will also give us strength to endure the toughest things in our life. Third thing, it will motivate us to holiness. It was, you know, when we read Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, we read that, um, you know, set your minds on things about, and then it continues down to verse 5, it says, put to death, therefore, whatever in, in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. You know, the church in Colossae, they were a young church, very active church, but the, the very force of temptations of sin, you know, they had this question, in, how do I deal with the lust of the flesh? How do I deal with all the sinful thoughts which are coming in? How do I deal with the temptation that I'm facing daily? How do I handle that? All the stuff that is going on inside of me. And, you know, being you know, a big city, they all had plenty of suggestions, always plenty of ideas. Chapter 2 gives us, you know, from verse 21, we see some suggestions as to the type of books that were available then. You know, it says, do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. Verse 21 to 23, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have in need an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they're not of no value in checking self-indulgence. They're good things, but they're not going to be sufficient to deal with the stuff that is going on in your heart. There's no material cure for spiritual ill. Imagine somebody is having an ulcer in his stomach and he's having pain. He's not, having to eat, not able to eat anything. You know, ulcer is growing bigger and bigger and he's going to the doctor and he says, he gives him, oh, it's okay. You take one painkiller, one, pa one uh, paracetamol, you, you will be fine. Treating from the outside, massaging the stomach, that will not help cure the ulcer. 
you have to look at it what is happening and then if surgery is needed surgery has to be done proper treatment has to be given just like that there is no material cure for spiritual ill our sinful nature has to be has to be dealt with we cannot overcome sin by the power of discipline alone it's not the law that changes the hearts but the gospel in so in colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 put to death the sinful kill it don't give an opportunity for it to come alive kill the sinful earthly things which is lurking inside you so just to sum it up here's the value of a person who has a new life in jesus christ and who set on things about three benefits why we should think on things which are about it will change our view of money and everything in this material world number 2 it will give us strength to endure the tough afflictions tough temptations and trials which we are facing in this world and it will motivate us to holiness and we need to find ways to build it into our lives on an ongoing regular basis so set our minds on things about if if not we'll be bogged down by this material world we'll be consistently you know trying to thrive and go go uh, you know in this rat race just to uh, be ahead of others just to get, let get the latest gadgets just to get the latest fashion just to get ahead of the people we will be consistently running behind that will be bogged down will be overwhelmed by the trials and difficulties of our life we will think oh how long is going to last this, this is never going to go away we'll be tired frustrated and disappointed by this life we'll not have joy in this life if we don't set our minds on things about we're going to find that the sheer power of temptation gets the better of us we will not be able to conquer the temptations so set your minds on things about some practical suggestions to set our minds which are on there some practical suggestions which i want to give i want to introduce this uh, very uh, you know pious man who lived in the 17th century he lived he lived in um, uh, you know he died in 16 91 if i am not mistaken 1615 to 1691 he lived for 76 years but this man he was a puritan he suffered a lot in his life i'll just give you you know jim packer wrote about him dr jim packer he says he's a chronically sick puritan he was tubercular since teenage years suffering constantly from dyspepsia dyspepsia is indigestion consistently you know having indigestion he had kidney stones headaches toothaches swollen limbs intermittent bleeding at his extremities and other troubles all before the days of pain killing drugs he had no pain killing drugs to alleviate the pain that he was suffering how did he endure you know when we look at his at the description we will think you know he is not having a happy life yeah that's what we might think of him and you know he he was suffering from his teenage years always struggling with wretched health you know imagine bleeding from the limbs imagine you know toothaches kidney stones you know in dyspepsia and headaches and all sorts of pain all over his body and no medicine to alleviate it and if you go and ask baxter richard baxter he says i spend at least half an hour every day meditating on heaven half an hour every day meditating on heaven that was his med medicine you know and he began this practice at the age of 30 and he continued it till he died till age 76 and you know jim packer dr jim packer wrote about him he says that cultivate that habit you know which he cultivated gave him daily doggedness in hard work for god despite the debilitating effects of his thick body and then uh, you know at the end of his or, or when you uh, at the end of his life he wrote a book called saints everlasting rest and in the last part he has devoted a whole last part you know if if you are able to it's available free in the net it's a little bit difficult language but if you get time just read it the last part of the book he writes about you know how to set our minds on things which are about according to pollution 312 so we're going to give you four suggestions on how we can set our mind on things about based on his book richard baxter's book the saints everlasting rest number 1 we have to take responsibility for directing our minds we have to understand it is our mind and we have total responsibility to set because the bible says set your mind it is not a request it is not you know if you can you try and do it no it is set your mind on things which are above you know we might be saying oh you know i am not able to concentrate 
you know, uh, you know, when we were studying in college, uh, we had a, a person called Vivek, and uh, you know, in the third semester, all of us, you know, except for five people, everyone failed in third semester maths in the class exam, internal exam, and we were all called by the HOD to the uh, to the to his cabin, asking us to give an explanation why we failed. And there was one guy called Vivek, and he said, uh, Derek might remember him. Uh, Vivek went into the HOD's room and he said, and uh, the HOD asked Vivek, why did you fail? He said, I cannot concentrate. He, and then the, the HOD asked him, why, why, why are you not able to concentrate? He said, because I'm not able to concentrate. This question and answer went on for several times and he, and he got so frustrated and threw him out of the room. You know, sometimes we have all sorts of excuses to why to kind of write away our failures. You know, we might say we are, we are not able to do this and do that. The Bible says, set your mind. We are risen with Christ. We are the power of God available for us. Take control of your mind and give direction to your mind. Take the responsibility to do what the Bible is telling us to do. We have to take responsibility. Nobody else. Not our father, mother, pastor, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, son, daughter. Nobody can control our mind. It is us. We must do it. This is a command. God said that we must do this. If we are raised with Christ, we have to do it. Not only we must do it, but we can do it because we are risen with Christ. And consider this as this way. This is our Christian job description. God has given us an ass assignment to do this well. This is a part of it. So we have to get serious about doing it. Don't just say that I, you know, I feel so terrible. I'm not able to do it. And, you know, I feel, feel so tired and I might get diverted into a lot of things. No, we have been trying to do it together for the past six weeks. Build these things into your life. You know, sometimes when we want to exercise and on a Sunday, for example, after church, we have had a good meal and we have a good game going on. Uh, let's say an IPL game going on. And we know we have to go out and do some job out of, out on, out on the, uh, the house. And we, we, our body says, not now, let's, let's eat some chips and let's drink some Coke and let's watch this game. You know, Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli is, you know, he's on his full form, full blast. Let's, let's see with, whether he gets a century or not. But we, what do we do when we realize there's a more important job? We tell our bodies, we direct our bodies. No, this is more, this is more important. We have to do this. We tell this and make it, make our body do this. So in that way, we have to take responsibility for directing our mind to set our minds on things about. Baxter you know, uh, makes, makes this very shrewd. A really wise Christian will be aware of the work and the weariness of his own soul in the same way that a person is aware of his body. Are, do you, are you aware of this? Are we giving direction to the inner life? The first one, set our minds. Take responsibility of directing our minds to things of heaven. Second one is... To learn the art of talking to yourself. You know, this is not what people do when they get mad. You know, people think that sign of is a sign of madness. It's not so. I'll explain. You know, when, you, when we read Psalms, it's all over in Psalms. You know, Psalms 103 says, bless the Lord, all the church. It doesn't say that. It says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's talk, he's talking to himself. You know, another Psalm, why are you cast down, oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Who is he talking to? He's talking to himself. You know, Martin Lloyd Jones, a very respected theologian, he says, we get into difficulties because we spend way too much time listening to ourselves. We are always listening to our minds. You know, when the mind says, no, you cannot do this, we listen to it. When the mind, when the body says, no, you're too tired, we listen to it. We never go back and teach our minds. We don't enough take enough time to talk to ourselves, talk to our mind, teach our mind according to the word of God. Our minds need to be set and needs to be told as to where to go. You know, just like training a dog and bringing it to our heels. You know, our heart will always be a problem and we'll be wandering in different directions. That's how we are. It has to be said, we have to take control over our mind and we have to direct it where it should go. That's why every good person has to you know, talk to our own soul. We need to learn how to manage our heart. You know, uh, he says an example of, uh, uh, you know, which we are all understand. He says, you know, imagine you, you know, hire a youngster into your office and uh, you, you gave him a very special assignment to do in, in the office. And even after two days, you see that he's never sitting in his, uh, on his desk. He's wandering around. He's talking to them, talking to other people, you know, not allowing them to do their work as well. And, you know, he's not doing his job as well. What will you do? If you are the manager of that office, what will you do? 
Very obvious. Get him into the cabin, is it? Guy, I have, I have uh, you need to realize why you have been called in here. If you don't do the job, tomorrow you are out of the office. Learn to manage our heart. Persuade it to the work. Don't accept any excuses which, the, which our heart will tell, tell us back to us. Chide it, scold it, beat it for it backward in us. Bring it into the service whether it is willing or not. And take it the complete authority which God has given to you and command your heart. If none of these things are working, if you feel too weak to do this, then call in the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.26 says, the Spirit of the Lord helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray, how we ought to pray. The Spirit of the Lord with groanings, He prays on our behalf according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is there to help us. So cry out, oh God, help me. My heart is all over the place. I need to set my hearts on things above. And He will help you out. Number three, direct your heart and your will by exercising faith in God's promises. Direct your heart and your will by exercising faith in God's promises. You know, there's a profound biblical psychology right here when the Bible, in the Bible says uh, this verse. Access says, let faith lead your heart as it were by the hand. You know, sometimes our hearts are not willing to follow the words of God. You know, let faith lead our hearts as it were by the hand. You know, let's say, I just want to jump to where uh, in Romans chapter eight, Abraham was told at the age of 75 that you're going to get, you know, children and that you, your children will be so numerous. Initially, he had trouble. His, his heart and Sarah's heart was troubled and they, they, you know, God had to tell them four times that you're going to have children. In, in between, they tried their own, own way to have children as well. But look at this, four things. What did Abraham do? Every time, once he was convinced, every time the heart would say, no, Abraham, this is not going to work. What he says, he hoped against all hope, he all hope and he believed. He told his heart, no, God has told us he's going to do it. Number two, in verse 19, he did not weaken in faith. And he had all the possible reasons to become weak in faith. What was it? His own body, which was already as good as dead. There was no life in his body anymore, he thought. And he looked at barrenness of Sarah's womb almost 100 years. There's no way that they're going to have children. He could have weakened in faith, but he told his heart, no, my heart. Bless the Lord. Whatever he has, he has promised, he's able to do. Verse 20, no distrust. And verse 21, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. We need to tell our heart, my heart, my God has promised this. My God has said that he has got, he's gone to construct a home for me in heaven. Heart, he's preparing a room for us. Heart, you know, we're going to get a huge reward. Heart, we're going to see God in full glory. Heart, we are going there. This life is a short life. This is going to be a temporary life, but we are going to an eternal life. We need to teach our hearts. And fourthly, use the joys of earth to propel our minds towards heaven. I'll tell you an example, you know, when we have the Lord's table that we, uh, we always remember of the time when Jesus is going to come back and then we'll have, uh, you know, uh, a time with him because that's what he has promised. Every time we remember it, when we have an earthly uh, or a communion, or a, a Lord's communion, we remember his coming. In the same way, when we have a, go to a good wedding reception, use that moment to say, you know, how good it is will be when we are gathered with the Lord in heaven for that great feast. Use the earthly things to propel our hearts towards heavenly things. Don't let the joys of this world be your anchor. When you receive the joys of friendship, marriage, propel your minds to heaven. Use all the moments when we give, get gifts from God and get good, get good friends and good fellowship. You know, imagine how, how much better it will be in heaven. Propel it. Finally, I just want to tell a few things, give a few suggestions to you. You might get into a point where you might meet somebody, a loved one, a friend who's dying. What will you say to them? They're in their deathbed, they know that they're going to die shortly. What will you say to them? If he's an unbeliever, if he or she is an unbeliever, this is a very difficult moment for any Christian. 
you know this person, you care for this person deeply, or you know, some of you are uh, doctors and studying to be doctors and nurses and you know, any other fields, we might meet these, these kind of people in the hospitals or in uh, different places. You know that they are not believing in Christ and they are going to hell. They have not followed Jesus. You feel that you should say something, but you don't know what to be, where to begin. You know, you remember this verse which we used in the first session, John chapter 8 and verse 12. We can start here. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You can tell him, you know, you're going into another world. Because Jesus has said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Since you have not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, you are going to a place which is going to be very dark because Christ is not there. There is also a world that's full of love, peace and joy because Christ is there. This is a time. Tell, tell that person. This is a time for honesty. I know you haven't followed Christ, but it's not too late to change. Christ and share the gospel in very short terms. You know, ask him for mercy. Ask him to forgive you and cleanse you. Christ carried the sins of others, your sins into his death so that you don't need to carry them into your death. And if possible, lead them in a sinner's prayer. You know, recently I heard of a pastor. You know, um, one person called him to his house. He said, you know, his mother is not a believer. She's 91 years old. They're from Goa. Never accepted Jesus Christ as his personal leader. Could you please come? So uh, he went there, shared the gospel. And uh, he heard that next day she passed away. But the son called and said, since the time you came here, since you, that time you came and shared the gospel, he, she was always praying, Jesus help me, Jesus help me, Jesus help me. You understand? See, that's the best time that you can put that seed of the gospel into that person's mind. If he or she is a believer, there are a few things that we need to take care. You know, even if it's a believer, some people get so afraid to face death at that moment because we are going to an unknown place People can get afraid. So we need to say that that time Satan will try to put a lot of doubts and fears into their mind. So we have to tell them, forget all that you have done or failed to do for Christ. You know, tell him, don't look at the life you lived for Christ, but look at the life which he lived for you. Forget all the things that you did in your life, your ministry, triumphs, failures, but only look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and what he has, he has accomplished for you. And you know, some people might be very disappointed. Oh, I could have done this and I didn't do this and I had should have gone there. And he says, you should tell them, don't, have, don't place your confidence in what you have done for Christ. But every basis for confidence in what Christ has done for you. Tell him that. You're not going to heaven because what you have done for Jesus Christ, but you're going to heaven because what Christ has done for you. Because you have trusted in his words. All that Christ accomplished is pure gold. You know, devil might point a lot of sins against us, but he cannot point a single sin against Jesus Christ. Don't look at what this person has done. Tell him your entrance into heaven does not rest on what you have done for Christ, but on what, you know, you know uh, uh, emphasize on this matter. There's a beautiful song by Horatius Bonner. He says, Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Another's life, another's death I stake my whole eternity. That's a pure gospel. Bank on it. You've heard the song, my hope is built on nothing less. And rest on the unshakable promises of God at death. You know, in the book, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bennion pictures the main character, Christian, is crossing a river. And then Hopeful is there with him. And uh, water is very deep and Christian fears that he might drown. But his friend Hopeful is saying to him, be of good cheer. I feel the bottom. And then it is good. It is strong. You will not drown. I told you about my grandfather's experience when he was going to die. One pastor, T.G. Uman, came and said, you know, Pastor George, this is the time. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to face death. Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is facing, uh, is waiting for you on the other show. Go ahead. You know, after that, you know, he called all his children one by one and gave promises. He gave to the youngest son, he said, you know, son, he was only 17 years old at that time. He said, son, you know, all my life, the bosom of God, Jesus Christ was enough for me. And that same bosom is enough for you, my son. He encouraged each and every one before he died. So you can rest your life, your death and your eternity on the unshakable promises of God. And count on the grace and presence of Jesus. You know, some people might be very fearful at death. Just tell them Corrie Ten Boom's story. 
you know, uh, yeah, I told you this story some, uh, some weeks back. Corrie ten Boom said to her father, my father, I'm so afraid whether I'll be have, uh, uh, of facing death. Corrie ten Boom's father asked her, Corrie, when you go to Amsterdam, when do I give you the ticket, train ticket? That just before I board the train. Corrie, just like that, just before the time comes for you to die, God will give you the grace to face death. You know, it, uh, the Sam says, even though I walk through the valley of death, Jesus Christ will be with us. The key to dying well is to live well. The whole of our life is a preparation for dying. So tonight I want to ask you, have you accepted the Jesus, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you die in sins or will you die in the Lord? If Jesus Christ comes back tonight, are you ready? Have your, have your sins been cleansed in the precious blood of Jesus? Are you pursuing a life of holiness? And don't trust in your merit, but rather in Jesus' merit. Shall we close our eyes? Hallelujah. The last few weeks, God has been telling us to set our minds on things which are above. Have we been able to do that? It's not just not for this Bible class, but till the Lord comes, this, these words which we were listening, which we were reading from God's word is true. Shall we close our eyes? Let's not put our trust in our works, our efforts, our merits, but only in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. Only Jesus Christ can save us. Nobody else. We're going to sing a song. My hope is built on nothing less, but on Jesus Christ. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. As Joshua leads us in that song, I request every one of us to, to pray. You know, you can look at the lyrics. The lyrics are there. But let this be a time of prayer where you surrender your life totally into the hands of the Lord. And say, Lord Jesus, I want to give my life to you tonight. To live a life of holiness. To be ready for the time when you come. Is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Oh, Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Oh, love the ground is sinking sand Oh, other ground is sinking sand When darkness fails his lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil On oh, Christ the solid rock I stand On oh, other ground is sinking sand On oh, other ground is sinking sand His hold is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around me my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay oh Christ the solid rock I stand oh the ground is Sinking sand, oh, other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, 
Oh, may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless to stand before the throne On Christ the solid rock I stand Oh, how the ground is sinking sand Oh, how the ground is sinking sand On oh, Christ the solid rock I stand Oh, how the ground is sinking sand Oh, how the ground is sinking sand Oh, how the ground is sinking sand